You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 326, conversation series, part three. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Looking forward to this. Yeah, this is our, our third part. I think we've got about five or six of these. So um, mm-hmm. it's inter- interesting to hear, uh, you know, how yep. how everybody's doing out there, first of all, and also how they're incorporating, you know, the material and the uh, I'll be in teaching it. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I just, I just like. I'm always curious as to what people are doing with it. So I, I kind of like, you know, hearing that. And you know, I always learn something, get a new idea, you know, do's and don'ts and all that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I like testimonies just generally and people's stories. So this is this just has a natural appeal to me. But we're back again with our third round of just having discussions with pastors or people who who teach in or around the local church or just teach groups of believers, uh, the content of Unseen Realm. Um, Again, this is in response to an email I sent out some time ago now about, hey, has anybody anybody out there tried this uh, on a sort of in an intentional way? And, you know, got an overwhelming response. And so, again, we're doing a few of these episodes because I like to hear people's stories uh, and I, I know listeners do too, you know, like, you know, how not, not necessarily focused on, okay, what, how did the content help you? But, but once you sort of got into it and, and had a good grasp of it, you, you know, had a, there was a certain comfort level there. How did you start trying to teach it in your ministry, whatever that is? So we have four guests again. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves and let's just start with you, Roberta. Uh, tell us who you are, you know, where you're at. I mean, whatever you, you know, you feel uh, is appropriate to share about, um, you know, yourself for the sake of the episode. Um, my name is Roberta Skolton. I'm in El Paso, Texas. I am not a pastor. I am a person in the pews, but I read your email and I thought just for the heck of it, I would tell you that people who sit in the pews can entertain the material Without pastoral guidance, um, I was first exposed to your name, Dr. Heiser, reading a book by Chris Putnam on the supernatural worldview. He had a segment in his text on the Divine Council, and he referenced um, your upcoming publication of The Unseen Realm. And my interest was immediately piqued because this was a topic I had not heard of. The Divine Council, so he provided a link to your website. I went, I read all your material, I printed it all off, including um, other um, works by other authors, principally Amar Anas, and... Um, you killed a lot of trees. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and and it, I pre-ordered The Unseen Realm uh, and Supernatural, and as soon as they came, I devoured them. I read, I principally focused on the unseen realm. Mm -hmm. And I realized that my life had been changed forever, that everything that I'd had questions about in scripture, I would mark in the margins. What the heck is going on with the angels? I don't understand this. And you had answered all my questions. And um, I shared it with other uh, women in my acquaintance. And we just, we decided to sit down and have at it. We took over a year to go through the Unseen Realm. We used all your materials that you provided on more Unseen Realm. If you referenced dissertations, we read those. If you referenced other articles, (laughs) we read those. I had read Facade and Portent. Right now I have a stack of over 12 of your books sitting in front of me. This is about the deepest dive that I've ever heard anybody (laughs) take. (laughs) We listened to all of your lectures that we could find. So um, we we had a saying from our group, this changes everything, but it changes nothing. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. because the gospel is still the gospel. The message yeah. of salvation is still the message. But an awful lot of those questions that we had that are not readily entertained in study groups, such mm-hmm. as what's up with the demons, um, those things were answered. And uh, I also had also read all the apocryphal works, had encountered Enoch and spent a lot of time scratching my head. And, wow. and, and incidentally, I just got your commentary on Enoch too. Wow. Well, that's, that's pretty remarkable actually. <laughs> well, let, let's, let's shift over to Frank, uh, and, and, uh, Frank, how, where was your entry point? I mean, describe that for us a little bit. My name is Frank Hartman and I'm a, I'm a teaching elder at my local community church, uh, in Boise, Idaho. Uh, I'm not on the pastoral staff, but I do, uh, teach adult Sunday schools, Bible studies, especially to men, and I fill in preach for uh, when our pastoral staff does go on vacation or other things come up. Um, I did go to seminary. I hold a Master of Divinity in Biblical Languages. And when I first encountered the book, The Unseen Realm, uh, I think I've read about it first, and I was kind of skeptical, to be honest. I thought, oh, boy, here's uh, here's some far-flung uh, uh, suggestions. But as I read the book, I realized that you were basing uh, your conjectures on actual linguistics and language as it exists in the books, uh, you know, Deuteronomy, et cetera. And so uh, that really kind of overcame that hurdle for me, that you were not just throwing out uh, theories, but that you were basing this on actual the, the way the Hebrew language was meant to be understood, especially by its original readers in its original context. And so that really impressed me. Um, I didn't set out to teach a class at my local church on the unseen realm. But mm-hmm. after finishing a long series of, of uh, going through the books of the Bible uh, last year, um, I was uh, considering which book should I teach on next to my adult Sunday school class. And I had just recently re- read a number of books from uh, Dr. Daniel Block on Deuteronomy and the Torah. And I thought, well, that'll be interesting. I don't think most people in their uh, adult Sunday school class curriculum usually get exposed to Deuteronomy mm-hmm. and what it means in the Torah. And and so I thought that'd be good to 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 go with. But I also during that teaching uh, stretch, um, I also incorporated the uh, Deuteronomy 32 worldview, as you describe it in your book, to kind of give a good framework of uh, exactly what Moses was talking about, things that Moses and the Israelites kind of took for granted that sound very strange to modern uh, worshipers in evangelical Christianity. And so I, I kind of folded that in there uh, when those chapters came up, when those topics came up, I would fold some of those same concepts that you brought out in Unseen Realm in. And um, uh, that seemed to be very effective. Uh, granted, most people at first said, what? Are you sure? But I showed them in the language. I showed them uh, it, it, the context. And the more they saw it, the more they saw that, hey, that's right. This does work. That does answer actually a lot of questions that I might have had. And uh, I found it to be very effective. Wow. I, I, without naming any source or anything like that, where did you where did you first hear about it initially? You know, well, uh, I first found out about the book um, through Logos, actually, because of your influence with Logos. And, and I uh, as a seminary student, I bought a number of resources through Logos. And so that was kind of where I first ran into it because it was part of your bibliography. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I didn't know much about you at the time and other works that you had done. Um, so my first impression was uh, because it did have to do with, uh, you know, the the standard demons and spirituality yeah. and things. And, and that can be a very uh, uh, that can be a very creative topic in evangelical <laughs> uh, authorship. Right. So at first I thought, oh, boy, here we go. You know, uh, but I, again, the more I read it, the more I found this that. You know, you're not speculating. You are basically anchoring it to what the word of God already says. And that really made an impression on me. And, and it and it cast a sense of legitimacy over uh, over the contents of the book. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm I'm glad you actually looked at the book. <laughs> Some people wouldn't. 
Doug, uh, why don't you introduce yourself as well here? Okay. Hi, Mike. Um, this is Douglas Kump, and I'm a pastor, a theologian. And I first uh, learned about um, your work. Uh, I was doing some research on the Trinity, and I was listening to some uh, lectures on YouTube on re- in reference to the Trinity, and I saw your video on the Jewish Trinity. And so I watched that, and that's the first um, time that I had uh, interacted with your material. And, of course, shortly after that, The Unseen Realm came out, and I wrote, I was a theology and media review writer at the time for a, a website ministry, and I wrote a review uh, about The Unseen Realm because, it, for me, it was completely uh, revolutionary. Um, and I had graduated from Bible college and seminary, and it's really the first time that I had ever uh, heard uh, this type of a teaching. So it was really revolutionary for me, and I thought it was extremely important uh, for people to uh, hear this information and learn about it. And so I am a minister and teacher of a home congregation or a house church, and I'm also a theology teacher. I've been teaching at a classical Christian school uh, in the School of Rhetoric, which is uh, equivalent to high school, for 15 years. And so for the last two years, I've been teaching the Unseen Realm material to my senior apologetics class. What I've really done is enter, integrate um, the Unseen Realm material or the Deuteronomy 32 worldview material into my apologetics curriculum, just explaining to my students how important it is to understand the spiritual warfare backdrop of, uh, in reference to doing apologetics and evangelism. And I've been teaching it to my uh, home congregation for the last two years. And the people are just both shocked and surprised. Number, shocked that they haven't heard this before and pleasantly surprised. And I've just heard uh, just remarkable uh, testimonies of how this has really brought uh, a greater understanding of biblical theology to their uh, entire worldview perspective. And it's just been a wonderful experience. My congregation has a lot of uh, Messianic Jewish, Jewish uh, participants, and uh, they've even never heard of this material. And one of the gentlemen whom I was part of my congregation he was just so excited about the material in the unseen realm that he asked me to basically meet with him in private and some, do some private tutoring. So we did that for about two months, and he's really excited about using this material to reach the Jewish people uh, with the gospel and, and give them a better understanding of you know the two powers and uh, the Jewish binetarianism that's so uh, clear uh, even in the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, if you if you look for it and make the connections. So it's been a great experience, both for my students and my congregation. And uh, they just love the material and are, are really using it to, um, I believe, further advance the kingdom. Wow. Glad to hear that. And uh, lastly, for this episode, we have Jason. Uh, Jason, can you introduce yourself? My name is Jason. I serve as a senior pastor at a small church in, I'll just put it this way, in the West. Um, I was first exposed to the Unseen Realm, uh, really actually through none of your maybe normal venues, but um, I had done my master's degree and I was not good with the languages. So I skipped out of the full MA and went with the master's of ministry, knowing that I could work on languages later. And I picked up the Logos, learn to use Greek and Hebrew. And although I'm still maybe not very good with the languages, that tool, when I sat there watching you walk through the text and walk through, you did a Bible study on the word sowed, uh, which was counsel. Mm -hmm. And that experience made me go, this guy, referring, you know, Mike Heiser, when he's dealing with the Bible, He's no holes barred. He is dealing with the text as it is, dealing with the words as they're there, um, not afraid of the scholarship and material, but doing a lot of his own legwork and then, then embracing the other material. And I was struck by that. And so over the course of time, what's happened is I have got to the point where I just think 
I wonder if Mike has said something on this passage. Uh, if I wonder if this ties into this mm-hmm. with this worldview. And that can be a dangerous thing when you always look to one person. But with with your material, you're always well resourced with other people. And so there's a footnote crumb trail to follow. There's things of that nature that are always available for me to do my own research and work. Uh, and so that really got me using it so much so to the point. I can't say I've deliberately taught through a lot of the material, but just that question of I wonder what the ancient Near Eastern person was thinking and I wonder what materials out there drives my teaching and drives my preaching to really approach it differently. Mm -hmm. And it's fresh for my people. Um, For some, it's very fresh. For some, it's very hostile. I've had people leave the church and one of the reasons they cited for leaving was I'm reading your books and that material is scary. Um, so, right. <laughs> you know, I, and that was after I, I was doing a, a Bible doctrines high overview of Bible doctrines and I got to the section of the book we were working through and it was on angels and demons and I told the people the first lesson. I said, we're going to cover the basics here in this book. I said, but I've been reading and thinking about this for about five years. And I'm going to do two more lessons on this after this skeleton that we're going to cover this week. And I covered the angel of the Lord and I covered the divine council. And I was putting like from Psalm 82, I put the, um, the morphology, just copy paste, showed them right out of the Logos Bible software on the screen. And I told them, I said, this has taken me a long time to get to this. And I don't want you to come here quickly. I want you to see what I'm seeing and see what others have seen and see why this is what it is. And uh, so two weeks, one on the angel of the Lord, one on the divine council, and, and I was kind of done. Uh, there was another Sunday school class I taught um, with the story of Na- Nehemiah, or I'm sorry, uh, Naaman. And in that story, I-, I titled the lesson Sanctified Dirt. And later I realized, oh, that was Mike Heiser's title for that. I, I stole his title without knowing it. Um, Good for you. <laughs> so anyway, I-, I realized I had been saturating in the material which is really how you how you need to get it. So um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that helps answer some uh, of those questions. Yeah, I mean that, those are those are all. That's a good introduction. These are all good introductions, you know, to how. You know, I'm always interested in how people first, you know, come across the material, and then especially, you know, when I send out that email to to my email list, I'm thinking, you know, there, because I, I get the question privately uh, in email, like, you know, I read your book and. I've been thinking about this and I listen to the podcast and I just, you know, I want, I want to be able to teach this to my people, but I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. You know, how can I do this without sounding heretical? You know, I, I get these questions. And so that's what, what prompted the, uh, the email to be sent out to the email list that, that all of you replied to. So I'm always interested in, you know, somebody's individual story, but then especially, you know, people who are charged with ministry, you know, to other people, you know, how kind of what people do with it, you know, and I, and I hadn't really asked, you know, en masse, like I'd, I'd never sent a, an email out like that before. And I was hoping to get, you know, seven, eight, ten people, we could do a, an episode or two, but it was just kind of overwhelming, you know, so now we're doing a whole series of these. So along with you know, your introduction, what I, I guess what what I'm trying to get out of these episodes is how would you advise somebody who is sending Mike the email? I, I want to be able to teach this, but I'm I'm nervous. I'm scared. I don't quite know what to do. I mean, you've all you're all doing it. You've all jumped in somewhere. So if we can talk about kind of I mean if if that person was in the group here, if that person is in the room that's just, you know, fearful, I'd like to hear about recommendations from all of you for what to do, what not to do. And then, you know, we'll just kind of take it from there. So how would you how would you encourage somebody to get started and, and where would you recommend that they start? Oh, this is Frank. So the what I would not do is to stand up in front of your audience with a copy of Mike's book and say, <laughs> now we're going to teach the unseen realm for the next, you know, 12 weeks or whatever. You know, right, that right. that is not the what I would do. Uh, what I would do, though, and I think is vital, is that is to uh, 
establish your credentials. Uh, to your congregation, you have legitimacy, you have authority, and uh, whether you are uh, fluent in Hebrew or or not, uh, though, though that would certainly help, uh, it helped me because my congregation, my class, uh, I they know uh, that I'm fluent in, in the biblical languages, so when I bring up points in my teaching, they know I'm not making stuff up. This is the real deal. You can go find out about it yourself if you'd like. So that level of authority, of expertise, kind of needs to be there first because you're about to lead them down a path that their first reaction is going to be, what? I've never heard this before. And to be honest, I've read some reviews about Unseen Realm, uh, and I'm not, I know Mike knows some of them. He's responded to, uh, regarding some of them on the blog that, that basically accuse him of saying, well, nobody's ever brought this up in the last 1,800 years or 1,900 years. Where do you all of a sudden have new revelation? <laughs> That's clearly they're not understanding the concept. So, But the congregation might do the same thing. But they're going to be trusting in the presenter that they are not just regurgitating what's in the book of Unseen Realm, but that they have the ability to show them what is the linguistic uh, uh, reasons for these conclusions. What are the contextual reasons that this has got to be the way it is, because this is what the writers of the Old Testament said that it was and uh uh, that level of authenticity is vital uh, with the, with the audience before in, uh, pursuing this path of teaching. Yeah, and 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 others feel free to chime in here. But another way of establishing um, credentials, you know, we'll, we'll put it that way. You know, you, you could also say for a lot of you know pastors, you need to realize that your people trust you too. I mean, you, this is your ministry. You should have built, a, you know, bridges of trust long already uh, to people. And, you know, just tell them, look, you know, they, I, I'm still me. You know, we, you know, we, we, ad, we adhere to our doctrinal statement like we always have. But, you know, we want to start thinking, you know, about some passages that may not be as familiar with you, maybe thinking about them in different ways. But we're still who we are, you know, just, again, to sort of, you know, draw on the trust factor there. but. Again, that, I'd rather hear what, what, what you guys think. So any, anybody else want to chime in on that point? If I may, mm -hmm. as a parishioner and as one who has had a multitude of questions over the years and as one who, for the very first time they sat down and read through Scripture in an unassisted format all on my own with only the Holy Spirit as my mentor, there were many things that I learned that were at odds with what I had been taught throughout my life. I, I ticked all the boxes in terms of Christian education and devotion to uh, attending service. And when I started reading scripture for myself and I saw the discrepancies between what I had been taught and what I thought I understood and what were, was being stated in your text and the materials that you provided supplementally. To say that I was angry would be a bit of an understatement as somebody who was sitting in the pews for years and felt that I had been deceived, misled, and the level of disturbance, shall we say, was profound. And I was so grateful for someone to have the courage to actually articulate that this has been known for years, but for some reason it hasn't been put out there, whether it's a function of fear or discomfort with biblical languages, really is not material to somebody who sits in the pew. They just want the truth, and they don't want a little bit of it because giving a little bit is a very slick way to lie. They want the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I felt very strongly that you did that in all of your works and you backed up what you said and your credibility was established by all of the supplemental materials that you provided. I was just 
overjoyed that someone would finally speak the truth. And all the questions that I had asked of pastors, of teachers, of the questions I'd encountered as an instructor were answered, and they could be answered rationally, logically, and fully uh, within the context of known scholarship. And I don't think you need to be afraid and treat your parishioners like they have to be packed in cotton and sent home to mom. They can handle the truth, and it would be really refreshing to have it. Anybody else? Uh, I'll jump in if you don't mind. This is Jason. Um, As a pastor, I think once you start transitioning into thinking, I'm going to put this in my material, I'm going to... I'm teaching through this course or whatever. I'm going to touch on these topics from the Divine Council worldview or Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Uh, I think one of the perspectives as a pastor is, is yes, it's, it's important you have the credibility established and your people know you and they trust you because they've seen you handle the word and you're honest with it. But as you are leading people, uh, I use the analogy of railroad tracks. Um, out here in the West, there's a lot of railroad tracks and you will not find a steep incline. You'll not find a sharp curve. Um, everything is gradual. And the reason it's gradual is because when you have a lot of weight and a lot of momentum, if you turn it quickly, you derail. And as a pastor, we're leading people and we want to be honest with the text and we want to work through that. But the knowing that sometimes people are going to have hiccups and we're going to need to stop here and dwell on this topic a while or answer a lot more questions or dig in just before they get satisfied with understanding that this is the right perspective. This is what the ancient Near Eastern people were thinking and viewing, and this is what the text says. And so it's just a a patience with the people, knowing that it's not going to change overnight. It's going to be kind of a a long process. And for me, it started way back in like 2005. So it's it comes out slowly, not that you're hiding information, because when I've given two copies of your books away to people who were eating up that type of of thinking and material, and I'd never received either copy back. Both people instead had marked up the books of the Unseen Realm I gave them, and they they bought me a new copy. So, you know, I, I selectively, how to say, if someone's interested, I will send them further and get them down the road. Um, but at the same time, those who are kicking and screaming, I'm not going to beat them over the head with the material. I'm going to just lovingly, graciously continue to teach and and put it out there and just continue to be gracious with the material. There was somebody in the, in one of the previous interviews that said one of the things that he had learned was people have to be ready, you know, for the content and some are going to be right where Roberta, you know, was at. I mean, like, just, just tell me the truth. I, I'm, I'm, I can deal with it. I'm, I'm an adult, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. And then there are others that, that are just, they reflexively are at this place where I'm trying to remember how the guy put it, um, where they, pe- there are some people who, who don't feel like they're, and he used the word allowed, like they're not allowed to think certain thoughts about, you know, angels or demons because they are accustomed to uh, essentially getting their theology or, or having their theology managed by their their tradition, whether they're you know the denominational documents or or the history of their tradition, um, and so because that has been really transmitted well to them, again whatever you know the tradition there is they're in denominationally, when they hear something different, they're they're naturally going to say, oh well did so and so you know, and I'm just making this up. This guy wasn't a Luther, but did, did Luther say that? Did Luther talk about that? I mean, they, they're, they're just going to reflexively go there. And when they when they can't find a connection, then there's this inherent um, resistance or suspicion. You know, so some people are just there. And again, that, to me, that that's where your relationship with those people, you know, again, a, a trust relationship is really going to matter uh, that you, you know, you, you can tell them, you'd be honest with them. Look, here's what the text says. Here's where I'm at. But at the end of the day, even if you don't agree with me, I'm still going to love you. You know, you're still, I'm still going to do my best to serve you, you know, that sort of thing. But it, 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 again, this is why I wanted to do these episodes because you all run into the whole spectrum 
um, that's out there. So, Doug, do you want to you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I've never uh, received any sort of negative um, feedback from either my congregation or the school that I work in. Um, my congregation, like I said, had just received this information with, with great excitement. I, I first started teaching the Unseen Realm material in the context of a series that I did on the deity of Christ and also a series on spiritual warfare. So the Unseen Realm material just gave them a biblical foundation for uh, those topics that you know, they hadn't had before, and it really helped them make sense of, you know, the deity of Christ as well as the um, the nature of spiritual warfare. And I always start with Psalm 82. In fact, when I teach my senior class apologetics, um, part of their midterm exam is to um, do uh, basically an exposition of Psalm 82 as part of their grade on the midterm exam. And so again, I've, I've integrated the material into my apologetics class. So it's not like I'm teaching a course on the unseen realm. I'm just implementing this and integrating this material into a year long apologetics class. And I thought for sure when I started teaching this material that I was going to be receiving email phone calls from parents and, you know, getting called into the chancellor's office for uh, teaching polytheism or, but I'm very careful to make sure that I teach the, the proper understanding of Elohim and things like that. And I've, I've not received one negative uh, email or phone call from any, any parent or any of the administration. And this is the third year that I've been teaching this material. I teach it pretty explicitly. So it's been well received. And I, I was somewhat concerned uh, about that and teaching at the school, but I was never concerned about it, teaching it in reference to my congregation. So it's all been positive, and um, I use the Bible Project um, in my senior class, and I think that that um, lends some uh, legitimacy to the uh, to the teaching as well. And the, the students love the. Uh, I mean, these are seniors, uh, but they really see those videos as being um, not only clarifying but also legitimizing the teaching, and it really helps them visualize. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm teaching. So it's all been positive for me. I've not received any, any negative. I mean, I, I've gotten tons of questions, mm -hmm. uh, definitely, but nothing negative. So it's all been a great do you, blessing. Do you have, is there a lot of overlap between the the parents, the, the people in your church and, and the, the also being the parents of the students you have? Is there a, a great deal of overlap there? Zero overlap. Wow. And, um, it's yeah, we, and I have a pretty large uh, school where I teach. It's a it's a church um, related school, so it's part, uh -huh. part of a, a local church. Uh, we have about 400 students. So I've been teaching there for 13 years out of my 15 years of teaching, mm -hmm. and I've been teaching these same students when I teach your material to the senior class. I've already taught these students for two or three years biblical mm -hmm. studies and church history, and so they're familiar with me. I'm familiar with them. And so it is a it really is a matter of a trust. And then I bring in, like I said, the videos and that helps them, you know, wow, this is something else that I mean, this is something that other scholars believe. And I do explain, at least to them in my congregation, that this is like like you say, this is like mainstream theology 101. But it it's just takes a while for that to trickle down into the local church and to the, the mainstream evangelical church. But everybody's been excited about it. Well, here, here's what prompts the question on, on a previous, uh, conversation episode. Uh, there was a, a, a pastor who started out his ministry teaching, you know, the youth, you know, middle, middle school through high school. And I thought this was a great idea. One of the things he did was, to, you know, to prevent teaching, you know, you, you give the content in the room and you got a bunch of middle schoolers and high schoolers there and then they, they process it in some way, okay, and then they go back home and they, oh, you never guess what, you know, Master <laughs> So-and-so said today. And and if it gets miscast or or summarized poorly, you know, he was afraid that he's going to get, you know, phone calls and like, you know, what's this heresy you're teaching? So what he did was he created a simultaneous blog for every lesson for the parents. It wasn't to summarize it for the kids. It was for the parents. And so... You know, that that was 
his way of saying, uh, you know, if, if your parents have questions or you have questions, tell them to go to the blog and, and then they'll know what we talked about. So uh, that's why I was wondering what the if there was a close connection there that that you kind of like were able to head off one issue because of that. But but your situation is totally different. That's actually quite interesting. Yeah, I would have done that had I received any feedback. Um, but I, I, I would say that I would never teach this material to middle school students. I do teach the middle school Bible classes as well, uh, but I would not introduce this to those students. I, I'm sure that I would get some feedback from parents <laughs> if I was teaching at the seventh and eighth. So I, I wait until the twelfth grade to do it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Here's another thing that I, I've I've been asking. Um, again, for the for the person, the the, the pastor who is, you know, like, oh, you know, he's on the fence. You know, I I don't know if I should or shouldn't. Can you recommend a specific topic or strategy to help that that pastor get started? Okay, they they have a different congregation. It's not yours. You don't know what their congregation is, but this person has come to you and said, "I you know, I know you know we we both like the book and and I know you're you're teaching it and and doing well, but yeah, I just don't know." So what? How would you get them started? What what's a good again a good entry point or a good topic? a good strategy to, you know, help them get started? Anyone? This is Doug. Doug. I just say in my case that um, it's, uh, I, I introduced this to my congregation in reference to uh, teaching through a series of the deity of Christ mm-hmm. and also spiritual warfare, just like a course. It was a biblical theological course on spiritual warfare, and then I did one on the deity of Christ. And, of course, with the deity of Christ, you can bring in the, the um, Jewish uh, ideas of monotheism and binatarianism and with the spiritual warfare, um, you can bring in this material, of course, that that's definitely the, the uh, foundation for spiritual for properly understanding spiritual warfare. So that's the two context uh, in which I brought it in. And with the school, again, it was apologetics. Yeah, I mean, what I generally tell people is find something that your people already hold dear and then either solve a problem related to that or some, you know, some criticism of that idea or show, you know, how this can, can really reinforce the idea. You know, there, there's a, they're already attached, you know, they already, again, something that they embrace. And so this can build on it, but anybody else where again, topics, passages, strategies, our times, our culture, is going through such a momentous upheaval right now. And we don't know if anything will ever be the same again. And trying to get a handle on what's happening, uh, dealing with the hostility that we see reflected in the media, the sharp divide in the culture, um, I think there are many questions among ordinary citizens that what the heck is going on? This doesn't make any sense to me mm-hmm. if people are so angry why are they so angry and and i think the answer to that very much relates to those who have spoken to the issue of spiritual warfare this is outright flagrant spiritual warfare we may not be seeing the players in the background because they exist in the unseen realm and can only be spiritually discerned if you're gifted in that regard. Otherwise, it just reflects a great big puzzle. But this text and the associated materials brings those unseen forces from out of the darkness into the light of of the testimony. Well, and let's take, let's take two two terms you just used and, and see if I'm I'm hearing you correctly. So you described essentially alienation okay i mean that you know people are angry the other one was angry you know that we have these you know, we have alienation and anger let's just let's just go with those it's it's alliterated so it must be good <laughs> um so we have we have these two things so a concept that again you could dip into the con the content would be okay just just even a very basic thing like god wants a family again this, this is why i wrote what does god want for people like a really at the, at the beginning level, but just a sense of family and how that gets you into talking about both worlds, you know, the family God wanted on earth, the family, you know, God had in, in the heavenlies and so on and so forth. So are, 
are, are you suggesting that we just take a look at our culture and try to tap into the, the anxiety and the questions that, that arise from that as, as good starting points? Most definitely. But something that is emphasized in the unseen realm is that God, yes, he is sovereign. He doesn't need us, but he wants to. He wants to work together collaboratively. He doesn't mind and he does willfully share power, not power maybe, but authority. He delegates authority to those he's created. And even if they sin against him, i.e. those in the celestial realm, he didn't take away the special skill sets that he gave them. They continue to function with those skill sets. No, we those in the earthly realm, we need to know that that they still have those special skills and abilities, and they're using them to our disadvantage, but that the Father has provided a way, warfare tactics, if you will, if you spend any time in the military, other than knowing your own military capabilities and armaments, etc., you the number one responsibility of a soldier is to know his enemy and everything that they bring to the battleground. So who your enemy is, how they came to be the way that they are, is essential for establishing some level of calm. Uh, There's no reason for you to lose your cool, if you will, when confronted with a very hostile situation. The Lord has provided you with a way. You need to know who these who your opponents are, and and you need to know how to deal with them, that you can resist Satan, and he will flee from you. You can rebuke them. The Lord did give you power and authority, or authority over all the power of the devil, and it's okay, and he expects you to do that. That's more of his willingness to share, to involve us in all that he's created. Anybody else? I mean, I, again, I think that's, I think that's a good strategy again, just to, I mean, I, I did it in a completely like different way. I mean, I, with the Stranger Things book, that there, that was just trying to take something in pop culture just to get people into the conversation. But this is, this is more, again, because of our, of the present circumstances, I think this is, is a, a powerful way to at least get people thinking on spiritual terms about what in the world's going on go ahead I th- th- this is jason um for me it was uh it took me a long time to be able to put what i was reading like an unseen realm and, and in a lot of your material into preaching and teaching because for me there was a vast disconnect between it on a practical level mm-hmm. and i'm not i'm not saying that disconnects there but it took me a long time to get that heartbeat of god is involved in family his he has an earthly family and the unseen realm as they what was in is still is his family and how he has a desire for us to be with us and that has has become very central in how i think about it because if it's just so much of the discussion and even before i was exposed to your material People want to nuance the difference between a watcher and an angel or a fallen angel. And and for a lot of them, it's just nuance that seems more speculation than text driven. And there's all sorts of theories and stuff out there. And it's all curious, but they don't always apply it to everyday life. And sometimes they're applying things that they got to from a speculative position anyway. So getting into the text seeing it from the ancient Near Eastern perspective, understanding and diving in, but then realizing this is about God loving us and sacrificially giving himself for us, and he has never abandoned us no matter what force is at work. Um, The Lord is with us, and he has a desire for fellowship with us, and we have a hope of home in heaven uh, eternally with him. And so that to me is has kind of driven the practical side of this uh, and it and made it much easier to bring it home with my people as I teach it um, through through one aspect or another bringing it back to that point I think is is crucial so mm-hmm. anyone else but I have this is Frank I'd have to concur with the others on the call that uh, have integrated 
the ideas of Unseen Realm into other studies. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, I, I did that specifically with a uh, study of Deuteronomy, but it could be done with a study of the Psalms, including Psalm 82. It could be done uh, in the New Testament as well. Uh, sure. When uh, a good example uh, with with Jesus being tempted by the enemy, um, I, I find it very interesting the ease with which uh, evangelical Christians today uh, understand that the enemy is real, a real entity. Uh, they they firmly stand that he is not to be just ignored or characterized or caricatured. I mean, but um, but on the other hand, that's about where they leave it. He's the he's he's the bad guy in the story, and that's about where they leave it. Um, and so we've kind of already jumped over the hoop of does the enemy exist? We have we have agreement that he is a created being and a powerful one at that. But let's now go further into that, especially if you're in, for instance, Ephesians chapter six. Uh, you know the spiritual warfare going on. Let's delve into that. What does Paul mean when he's talking about these, and why does he talk about those? Um, had a Bible study recently where uh, a question about the Tower of Babel came up and and uh, in relation to then Acts chapter two and the reversal of uh, the effects of the Tower of Babel. And and so there's there's so many uh, footholds, uh, handholds that I think a teacher or pastor could use just to inject uh, some of the basic framework. So that uh, it's a little bit here and a little bit there. And sometimes that'll prompt some questions and sometimes it won't. But the more you do it, the more uh, it, this will fit into the into the overall worldview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the typically the, the last question I ask is what would help? <laughs> um, you know, this is this is all I mean, the suggestions are good. The ideas are good. Uh, but. Is there something that you wish you had or that would have been really useful that still doesn't exist? And, and I ask that because, you know, there are people out there who are going to be listening to this that are working on stuff. I mean, the, 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 the content gets repurposed by people. And, you know, there are other people out there who are just looking for the right idea. And, and, you know, for myself too, you know, I, sometimes I, you know, I have a whole list of things I, I could do. I'm still, you know, interested in, in where the holes are, you know, like what, you know, what's missing that would be helpful. I mean, you have Unseen Realm, and we did Supernatural at the same time. Again, Unseen Realm was for the person who's got some Bible under their belt, isn't intimidated by books with footnotes. And then Supernatural was for the average person in the pew. And then I, I went and did, you know, what does God want on my own, just for the the new believer, you know, or the seeker. And, and there's a stepping stone there, you know, in theory, you know, somebody could start with what does God want and then graduate to supernatural and then graduate to unseen realm. But, but, you know, that's, that I can see that is a, is a nice progression there. But, you know, what I can't necessarily see are what, where are the holes? Uh, so what, what would be, um, what do you want? What would you like to see? Just to get it done. Do something. I, I don't know how it is in other parts of the country. But here uh, in, in far southwest Texas, our, our gatherings are limited to 10 people or less. So churches are canceled. Um, and that uh, attendance at church service, which many people feel is an anchor and provides them with some stability, that anchor has been taken away. How do they deal with that? Um, how do they deal with the loss of frequent uh, Eucharist services? How how can they handle all of these changes that are coming at a breakneck pace? So yeah. even if you do um, some kind of teaching over your church website, you know, where you have normally recorded sermons or messages, you know, start something there. Uh, how to deal with the uncertainty of these times. Um, it's, it's really fascinating that you bring that up because, again, we, we just recorded another one of these, and we had, a, we had a guy in there, and his circumstance was basically it was, it was like two uh, church splits and or failures, and, and he wasn't a, a, like a preaching elder person, but he'd been involved with the church for, you know, I think he said 20 years or something like that. So it sort of fell to him to 
to do something here. And they, they met and watched, you know, videos, you know, Bible project videos. And then that's where he, he stumbled onto my content out of that discussion. You know, that was the Genesis for that, but it was like, we all said, isn't it great that there's a lot of this content that is out there? And, and his people, in his case, his people were just not, it was hard for them to make that adjustment to calling church watching this video. But he said, now three years down the road, it's like they've, they've just grown by leaps and bounds. But then the, you know, the flip side of it is it still needs vetting. <laughs> you know, it's not like, I mean, there's a lot of content out there, but it, it's still, you know, it's, it still doesn't have the, this is a good thing to listen to. Don't please avoid this label, you know. So it, it's out there, but essentially since the podcast, you know, has become more well known that it, it helps and the Bible project when they put something out, then people, okay, there, there's a trust factor there. There's a, there's a content payoff factor there. So I, I hear you, you know, but it's just fascinating that you would bring that up because we're just right on the heels of, of having done, you know, another one of these and, and sort of the same thing came up. The concept of vetting that almost everyone has spoken to is curious to me. Um, pastors are already fully vetted if they're standing in front of their congregation yeah. and that, that you would be questioned the unless other, there's some. The other discussion was just since this, this fellow wasn't technically a pastor, you know, they, how can I put this? Um, they had to get over the hurdle of of someone that they had not chosen to be their pastor and and really was wasn't even part of their group it's just some guy on a screen that that was the difficulty you know but but again they to their credit they trusted this guy to to do that but you're right you know if 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 we're talking about pastors just putting out content people that already have the relationship yeah that that far that problem should be removed i mean it shouldn't even be there Lots of times, if, if churches have home cell groups or however they're called for small group study and discussion and fellowship, um, people get thrown into that position. Mm-hmm. Um, they haven't been vetted at all, and they find themselves dealing with content for which they are not prepared, but they struggle through it or they consider themselves mentors rather than than actual teachers or leaders. But if if the pastoral staff and those that they've, you know, whether it's through whatever church government structure your denomination has, um, can go through their fellowship and find others that are willing to be trained with them and then go out and work through their home fellowship groups to maybe have opportunity for intimate discussions, um, that would be helpful as well, I would think. Anyone else? Yeah, this is a Douglas. Um, it, this is actually a great time uh, to be the pastor or minister of a, a home congregation or house church. And I think that um, this movement is growing. And I think it's going to be really, in some sense, the uh, future of the church. But um, in reference to what needs to be done, I would like to see more people take your material and apply it to specific topics. Um, For example, I am doing some work right now on applying the material in the unseen realm to uh, the Marian apparitions. And I'm pretty shocked at how relevant that material is to uh, that particular topic. And I'm also, I mean, it's basically all notes right now, my teaching notes, but I am developing a, a curriculum for the high school seniors that will be the unseen realm material applied to the already, you know, we already have a curriculum for apologetics, but I'd like to put that together in a more uh, formal way. But I, I just like to see your material because you've already laid the groundwork, the, the foundation, the broad scope of things. But I really think that uh, Christians, pastors, uh, scholars, theologians need to take your material and apply it to more uh, applied specifically to topics. That's all I can see done. It's one of those things for people listening out there. Look, Doug, you know, where, where you're at, you're, you're doing that. You see the need to do that and you're doing that. You know, maybe that's something that can filter down in some way or filter out, you know, to other people. But, but, but people in the audience, this, that, that's a great idea. 
that is something that every everyone in uh, in church leadership who has a good grasp of the content, you can do that for your your people or your youth group or whatever. That's a really good idea. Well, I just want to thank everybody for you know sharing their time uh, for doing this. Uh, if there's anything you you want to sort of close with, feel free. Uh, but otherwise, we'll we'll draw the episode to an end. But anybody have anything else that they want to just sort of leave the audience with? Thank you for asking. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, thank you for the opportunity to let you know personally how incredibly life changing this material is. And speaking for myself and the others in my study group, we are eternally grateful to you um, for your pioneering in this area. And I would encourage everyone who listens to the podcast, don't be afraid. Step out into the great unknown and the Lord will bless your efforts um, uh, with everything that you've provided. I think that's well said. Anyone else? You know, if not, I'm, again, we are grateful. You know, Trey and I are grateful You know that uh, you took the time. I know sometimes it's like it's tough to get episodes together when we have, you know, four or five people involved, but just thanks for carving out some scheduled time and doing this with us. Yeah. Thanks to you, uh, Trey and Mike for doing this. I really appreciate it. And your work is, uh, is uh, going out. It's causing a great um, revival, at least in my uh, context. I'm very thankful for it. Well, you're welcome. Again, we, we try to be useful and Lord willing, you know, we, we produce things and let, you know, let the Lord do with it as he pleases, you know, as he wants to do something with it, he will. So thanks again uh, for everybody you know, for meeting with us. Thank you guys very much. Love what you do. Yeah, thank you as well. I um, appreciate the invita- invitation and uh, and all the different ways uh, through Memra and others that uh, you, Dr. Heiser, are continuing to spur on uh, the laity as well as the pastoral uh, uh, people throughout the United States to uh, – Keep up on those languages. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Mike. Well, there you go. Another great conversation. Uh, we've had three of them now. We've got, I think, two more scheduled. So, uh, again, it's always interesting to see how people are taking the material and repurposing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. That's what we want to see happen. Uh, and that that's the kind of ripple effect that will really matter. All right. Well, again, we want to say thanks to Doug, Roberta, Jason, and Frank for joining us today. And we want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 